All right, Doc, it's April 15th, picking up where we left off a little bit. Um, I was curious about Third Recon and its time in the A-Shaw, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, was Third Recon, Third Force Recon, given a presidential unit citation for their actions in the A-Shaw? No, we were given the Army's valorous unit citation, and uh, we were the second only the second Marine Corps unit to ever receive that award. The first was uh, <clears throat> eight inch guns up at uh, Kantian <clears throat> earlier in the war, I think 67. And then we got it because of our association with uh, the Army's second and 17th Air Cav. And what that is, uh, the, the unit uh, citation looks like the Silver Star with a uh, uh, gold frame. Uh, it's uh, shafts of uh, rice growing up on uh, all around it when, to describe the ribbon. And it's uh, every one of the unit rates the silver star. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, presidential unit citation, uh, no. But uh, Army Valorous Unit Citation and the uh, Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry unit citation. We we uh, were awarded that as well. Well, and through that, I mean, a lot of it comes from the leadership within Third Force Recon. I know it that's mentioned throughout your book of some of the officers or the NCOs like Sergeant Jocks, who had been in the Marines since, what, 1948? Yeah, yeah. Jax was... Uh, uh, well, I can remember uh, he's passed away now, but uh, he had Chesty Puller as a uh, as a commanding officer when he was in Hawaii, and he tells a very interesting story about um, he was a, a, a sergeant of the guard, and uh, Puller's sedan showed up, and uh, out came Colonel Puller and his son, uh, Lewis Jr., and he was crying and. Puller marched him in there and he said to Jax, I want you to put him in the brig. And he said, what? He said, yep, yeah, lock him up. Um, he refuses to swim. And uh, I, I want him to learn how to swim. He doesn't want to learn how to swim. So he's going in the brig. So <laughs> Jax did what he was told and he, and he put this little kid, I, I can only imagine he was like six or seven, maybe five, six or seven years old in this cell and Puller drives away and uh, Jax went in and talked to him and he said, look, I, uh, you know, your dad's our CEO, but we don't want him down here, you know, all the time uh, with these kind of requests. So I'm going to take you to the pool and I will teach you how to swim uh, just to get you out of this brig cell. <laughs> Which to me was a hilarious story, but yeah. So J Jax was, uh, um, he wasn't involved in World War II. He was in after World War II and, of course, Korea and, uh, and Vietnam. But uh, one of the points I tried to bring out um, on the teaching aspect was uh, we have a, a famous Marine Corps general, which is General uh, John Lejeune. And... Uh, he set the uh, standard for education back in the 1920s. And he said, uh, I want the officers and the senior staff NCOs, and, and I'm paraphrasing this, to adopt a uh, student-teacher relationship or a father-son relationship with your Marines. And it's not that you walk in and you're the lieutenant and they're just a bunch of dumbbells and you know everything. It's not like that at, at all. We teach you at the basic school or NCO school a number of classes, courses, and lessons, and you need to impart that on your junior Marines. So it's not going to be, um, why do I do this? And, and the answer being because I said so, or because I'm a sergeant and you're a private, it's 
the reason that we're teaching you this is because, and whatever that reason may be, ultimately because it may save <clears throat> your life, <clears throat> excuse me, or the life of others. So uh, that was uh, a, a absolute way that courses, and uh, bear with me. And classes were taught so that uh, it wasn't done in a way of uh, demanding. It was truly an educational environment of we do these things um, to train you so that you will train others when we're not here, when we're gone. And I thought, well, that's a, that was a great way of doing um, handling business. Um, and most of the time, it was from the people who had experienced it firsthand. You know, it's it's one thing to read a book or to uh, to be a teacher and talk to a bunch of students and say, okay, this is what it's like uh, in combat when uh, for the first time you're receiving incoming fire and you're reading this or a passage from a book about rounds uh, snapping over your head. Um, it's a lot different when someone who's experienced that tells you about it uh, because people are going to ask questions like, were you afraid or what was your biggest challenge as a corporal, which might have been to get people to get up and move uh, from, an, from a, a covered or concealed position to another position um, without getting shot. And that's where the true leadership came in is, uh, are you going to be listening <clears throat> to a corporal or a sergeant or lieutenant when he says, first squad, get up and move, you know, east, west, north, south, whatever, uh, or join me or, you know, whatever the command may be. Um, it has to be done in a convincing way. And then to tell that story later, you have to be able to do that uh, to the degree that all imagination is removed because you're hearing it from someone that experienced it, not some guy telling some bullshit story um, because he was never there, but from someone who was there and experienced it. And I, I mean, there's, there's nothing better than a primary source, a first person telling you what it was like on board a submarine or or on board an aircraft and uh, or a helicopter that's now uh, uh, smoking and is going to have a... Uh, uh, auto rotation crash landing uh, and you walk away from it and you think, holy Christ, you know, what was that like? And it, it, all these different experiences, reading about it is one thing, but but hearing about it or listening about it or getting classes on it by someone that experienced it firsthand, um, it's, uh, you know, you, you can't replace that. So anyway, the, uh, the idea being, if you adopt that uh, student-teacher and father-son mentality to the classes that you teach, uh, I think you have a much better outcome with your students. They, they are much more prone <clears throat> to being receptive. That's just my my thought. Well, and even with your time in Force <clears throat> Recon, that's mentioned with how the officers and NCOs acted um, in the base out on patrol is that mentality. Um, I mean, and, you know, you mentioned that through this, the officers specifically, I know of Major uh, Lee, Lieutenants Kaufman, Morris. I know uh, there's um, a Corporal Grape that's mentioned. And, yeah, Grape Vineyard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, yeah, it, it was. Uh... I mean, Alex was a really smart, smart guy. Uh, sixth generation Californian, a Mensa guy, uh, brilliant, super well-read individual. And uh, I mean, he was he was smarter than 98% of the people in that company, but he didn't walk around like some aloof guy of, I know everything, it was, um, well, I'll give you an example. When when we found out that we were going into the Asher Valley, 
Alex and Kaufman had read books on this, uh, I think it was an English gentleman, a hunter named Corbett. And his big thing was he hunted big game in Africa, lions and leopards and all, all water, you know, Cape Buffalo and all. But he also went to, I believe, um, a number of trips to India to hunt tigers. And then he found out, uh, or they found out, that the Asho Valley and the northern part of South Vietnam was an area where a lot of these Indian maharajas uh, would come to hunt tigers. And they said, you know, we better warn these guys that they may encounter tigers. Because, you know, that thought doesn't even cross your mind. It's like saying, well, let's go on an inland passage trip uh, to Alaska without anyone telling you, hey, you know, they've got brown bear or grizzly bears up there that'll kill you in the blink of an eye if you encounter them, particularly a sow with a couple of cubs. So we had classes on uh, tigers, um, the habitat that they uh, existed in, their food, their their method of attack, all, all these different things. Um, now, I never saw one. I never saw a tiger um, while I was in Vietnam, not, not a live one. <clears throat> but they were out there. And we heard them on a couple of occasions. And we thought, I mean, the first time you hear it, and there were two of them, um, it, it would make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It's a you know, primordial response, I'm sure. But uh, these things were were huge inside. I mean, that, that's the largest cat that we have, and their their strength is unbelievable. But just to have um, cl a class on the uh, Bengal tiger, uh, we thought, boy, that's really outside of the box. But it was something that uh, you could encounter. Just as an as an example of uh, not your, you know, your primary uh, grunt platoon is not getting briefed on um, what do you do if you see a tiger? Do you run? Do you stay motionless? Uh, do you engage uh, if you feel threatened or 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 what? But it was just another simple thing that could happen, and this is what you should do. So those kind of classes to me were were tremendously valuable. Um, because it might save uh, our lives, or if Lee and Kaufman left for any reason, if they were sick or injured or killed, wounded, and had to leave Vietnam, now you have that information, and you can tell a new guy coming in, hey, this you may encounter something like this, and this is uh, what you need to know. Just as a simple example. Well, I think it leads credibility to your earlier statement about that father-son relationship is that when the veterans or the experienced guys rotate back home or if they're killed or wounded, then those of you that have been learning, you now step into that shoe of the father mentality teaching, training the new guys coming in itself, taking them under your wing. And it's a repeating cycle. Well, they realize that the the team leaders that we had <clears throat> were primarily corporals and sergeants. We had, uh, I know Staff Sergeant Beltrain was one uh, as a staff NCO, but the majority of team leaders were corporals and sergeants. And these were young guys, but they realized that they were going to soon be sergeants and staff sergeants and ultimately gunnery sergeants and first sergeants. And uh, if they stayed on, in the Marine Corps. And uh, they carried that knowledge with them. And it was uh, it, not only the knowledge, but how to impart that in a classroom, where if you looked at the class of 20 young Marines and you think each one of them is my son, what would you want your son to know uh, if he was going off uh, and into a, a combat zone, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan or or Vietnam, you'd want them to know everything about uh, simple things like putting a 
Palazone tablets in the canteen so you didn't get sick from uh, contaminated water, uh, staying off the skyline at night, not smoking. I mean, just simple little things that might save your life. And then afterwards, that information is uh, passed along to new guys coming in. You know, how many guys here smoke? Okay, raise your hands. Well, <clears throat> that's all going to be curtailed because there's no smoking after four o'clock. Why? It's not because I said so. It's because your habit of taking out a Zippo lighter and flicking it on might cause a grenade to be rolled in and get you and, and your two friends beside you killed. That's why. So for every question, there should be an answer, not just a blunt because I said so. Yes, sir. So, you know, and that's the way they looked at it. I mean... <clears throat> I'm sure there were times when <laughs> an instructors being short with people saying, because I said so, uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, these classes were um, always enjoyable, uh, very much educational. And we all carried notebooks with us, these small green memorandum flip up notebooks and uh, to take notes and go over it. And there was always a question and answer period afterwards if you didn't understand something. If it was a, a map and compass class, or you know, how do you visualize contour lines on a map? And, and it might get rushed through in the teaching of the class, but afterwards you could go to these people and say, you know, I'm not sure I understand this. Would you go over this with me? Absolutely, glad to. So it was, uh, it, it made the learning environment fun. And I think that's that's half the battle right there, if it's enjoyable. You know, we've all walked into a classroom and, and as we go through that doorway, we're thinking, oh Christ, here it comes, you know, algebra or geometry or trigonometry or, or history. And whether they think it's too difficult or uninteresting or, you know, uh, if, if the instructor makes it an enjoyable, thought-provoking class, uh, then that cloud is lifted and they think, you know, that wasn't so bad. I'll look forward to the next session we have and uh, I might learn something. <laughs> so that's the way they approached it. I, I would I would say they wouldn't argue that, that point at all. It was supposed to be a, a, a father-son student-teacher environment. Well, and in that environment, I mean, with the brilliance of the education, it makes me wonder when some of those figures that you look up to, some of those more reliable guys, when they get hit or if they get killed, how does that affect Third Force Recon in terms of morale and mentality? Um, especially, I know that uh, in January, February 1970, Third Force Recon lost some key guys in some short, very fierce ambush engagements. Yeah, we did. And of course, well, you can... Well, it's easy to say, but it's tough to imagine unless you experience it. But imagine being with uh, five guys every single day, all day long, night and day. You sleep and train together. Um, and then three of them are killed uh, in one morning. Yeah, how does that affect you? Well, you know, five different phases of, of, of disbelief, of, of, of anger, of remorse, um, you know, all these different um, emotions. <clears throat> it's, it's uh, and then, of course, it goes on to weeks and months and years later, and you're thinking, uh, gee, wouldn't it be fantastic to have had uh, guys like uh, Bishop and Furman and and Danny Savage and Adam Cantu uh, alive today, uh, what would they have become? Uh, would they have been uh, teachers or doctors or or uh, politicians or, or whatever path they choose to take? But it was taken away from them through no fault of their own. Uh, you know, they had volunteered for this duty. They knew it was hazardous and. And you didn't believe it would happen. And then it was a absolute slap in the face of our own mortality. 
when uh, when your best friend is killed. And, uh, you know, just imagine uh, your best friend, uh, you know, this morning is killed in an automobile accident an hour from now. And you get you get a phone call and think, oh, my God, the guy was married and had three kids. And, and what, you know, how do you process all that? The the disbelief and the uh, the sadness, uh, the remorse, the, the anger about when you find out how it happened or why it happened, if it was a drunk driver and, you know, it's, it, so many emotions rush through you. And, and while that's going through, you're told, okay, uh, suit up, you're going out tomorrow. And and it's like, geez, I, I don't even have time to mourn the, the death of these guys because you're going to the field again. And, and that's exactly what happened. That's the way things, the, the, the pace was, was that fast. Okay. Um, even even if you're in the field and someone gets sick or injured or wounded, uh, they are now a, a, a liability. They're not an asset. <clears throat> an asset because their ability to help you is gone. And in fact, it it adds to the problem if you've got a six or seven man team, and let's just say a guy falls down and breaks his leg, you know, which, which could could happen. Right now, you've got to get him medically evacuated. That compromises the team because a helicopter is going to come in and gives away where you are. And in the meantime, uh, if the weather is bad and they can't get a helicopter in to get him out, uh, someone's going to carry him. Someone's going to carry his weapon and all his gear. Uh, the corpsman's going to make sure that he is stable that the fracture is splinted correctly. And, uh, you know, a fracture can cause can cause death if you've got blood clots that move. Uh, and if this guy's in a lot of pain, are you also administering morphine? Uh, is he screaming? Uh, and all these different things happen very, very quickly. So it can, it, the emotional part is there immediately. And then there's the, okay, the reality sets in of, how do we get this guy out of here? Where are we going to move to as soon as the helicopter leaves? Or can the helicopter get a jungle penetrator in or land to get this guy out? There are so many things. And and you're trained to address all these things because any one of those things can happen. You know, does everyone know how to uh, get a, a medevac bird in? Does everyone know where we are on the map? So if if the guy with the map is down and you can't get to him and his map uh, and you have the radio and they say, where are you? Uh, you have to know. So map reading classes were, were absolutely of great importance as was the radio and how to use the radio and the different frequencies that you would go to on the radio. Um, and what happens if your battery is running low? Do you know how to change the battery on a on a, a Prick 25 or whatever radio you were carrying? So you can just see it's like a domino effect. One thing leads to another. Everyone has to be trained and cross-trained with one another's job and responsibility. Radio and map reading and first aid, uh, weapons, care and maintenance. I mean, those things are always continuous. So, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, and and some of it you're just on automatic pilot. I mean, no one should have to tell you that when you wake up in the morning, uh, you're going to clean your weapon. You, you, you know, one or two guys will be on uh, 100% alert, and you're going to break down your weapon and uh, clean it and lubricate it and put it back together as quickly and as, you know, say, professionally as you can to make it a fully functional weapon. So, you know, are you carrying the right lubrication? You have the cleaning rod and the patches and, and any tool that you may need. So there's so much that goes into it. Um, and now you become a teacher once you've gone through mission after mission after mission. You know these things and it's automatic and you're teaching the new guy who joins you all of these little tips and tricks and, and uh mandatory things that they need to know and to do. <clears throat> Once they learn it, 
Now they become a teacher, and the progression just continues on. So, well, I mean, with that too, the experience that you get one in educating to the cross training. I mean, in the field, whether you're in Vietnam for a tour or for some guys, maybe even a second tour, or even if you get sent from third force recon to first force recon, that stays with you. And you bring value now to a new team in itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, yeah, and it's not to say uh, there was any less training in the reconnaissance battalions. I mean, they had four companies in uh, – Third Recon Battalion and First Recon Battalion, they did the exact same thing that we did. Uh, so you've got uh, multiple people doing the same type of things. And, uh, you know, so many guys got out after their their time in Vietnam, and a few of us stayed in. And now you had the, uh, the corporate knowledge, as it were, to uh, make sure things got taught. Or if you stayed out of the Marine Corps and you went to a grunt unit, uh, you'd say, okay, these are some of the lessons that I learned. Um, I'm sure you've got lessons that you learned that I need to know. So it's not just a one-way street. It's always that ebb and flow, that student-teacher thing, because everyone brings something to the table, whether you're a, a, a PFC or, or a lieutenant colonel, uh, you don't know it all. And that PFC may know so much more about a uh, an engine in a vehicle that the uh, school smart lieutenant colonel doesn't know jack shit about. <clears throat> and he's going to turn to that Lance Corporal and say, you know, this thing won't start. Uh, why? And and can you get it running? And of course, the kid says, yeah, no problem. I, I think I know what's wrong and he can fix it. So, you know, never make that assumption that you know everything because of the uh, the uh, grade that you're in, uh, you don't. You don't know everything. And you better be willing to learn uh, and learn it for a number of reasons. One, for your own education, and two, to be able to impart what you've learned to others. Absolutely. Now, to this day, Doc, are you still involved in teaching any of the recon uh, classes or being involved with even Marine Corps recon today about your experiences that you learned in Vietnam? I've done some um, podcasts um, and a, a number of interviews uh, for Congressional Record, the Library of Congress. Um, but as far as teaching, uh, I would say, I would tell you no. Um, I haven't gone down to uh, Camp Lejeune or out to Camp Pendleton. Um, I mean, if I was living in the area, um, if asked, I would, I'd be happy to do that. But, uh, you know, now it's easier to just do it in the uh, comfort of, uh, of my office. <laughs> so I don't have to travel around the country. But um, I think the, the fun part also was in uh, the writing of these books, um, where you uh, get to tell the story. So, I mean, I, I get <clears throat> I get phone calls and I get particularly text messages from guys uh, that said, hey, I read your books back in the 1990s and they had such an impact on me that that's why I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Or that's why I wanted to go uh, join a uh, Marine reconnaissance uh, company. Uh, I, I thought it would be... Uh, a great thing to do and that that has a, uh, a great effect on me that i would be able to influence someone not meaning to but just to tell the story uh, in such a way that someone would say yeah i'd like to be a part of an organization like that and and any organization can be like that if the leadership uh is as good as what we had back in 1969 and 70. That, that's going to be um, you know, hard to do, but there are those uh, warriors out there, um, guys like uh, Alex Lee and, and Bucky Kaufman and uh, Noam Heisler and uh, Chris Sarden Henderson, uh, who are those kind of teachers. And, and they're, they're, they're still here today, absolutely. 
Now, outside of yourself, I know there's been a number of other books written about Force Recon, um, and a lot of it has been memoir perspective. So outside of, of course, your Force Recon diary, do you have any other book recommendations for individuals wanting to learn about actions and the perspective of Force Recon members in country? Wow. Um, I've read a couple of them. Uh, some I some I liked and some I didn't care for. Uh and I, I, I really don't want to do a, a, a book title assassination uh, on them because <laughs> I didn't I didn't like them. I don't think that's fair because the the author is not here to defend himself. But um, there are a number of books uh, that have been written. I think there are a bunch of new books that are coming out now as well. Um, I just read. Uh, a book that was sent to me by uh, a Marine who was a dog handler in Third Force Recon. And his tour, uh, and he's in the book that I, I have done on Voices from Vietnam. His name is George Alexander. And I, I didn't know George, I didn't serve with him. But uh, um, Captain Floyd, Bill Floyd, who was a lieutenant, later lieutenant colonel, and was the CEO of Third Force Recon uh, when they first went over to Vietnam. He requested and got uh, dogs uh, to work with the uh, reconnaissance Marines. And uh, George's story is very, very interesting. Uh, and it, it, some of it really makes me smile. He had a, a dog. Uh, I think the dog's name was Major. I believe so. And to the degree that the dog was a very light colored uh, bird dog. And he put camouflage paint on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and in his book, there's a picture of it. And you think, holy cow. And uh, George done well for himself. And he was a, he's a, uh, very much into martial arts and is in a, you know, uh, I don't want to uh, insult uh, the degree of, of black belt uh, karate. Uh, that he holds, but he, he's a master at that. He's also a, a very well-known diver, and he's kept all those uh, skills that he learned and continues to do that. And he's he's as old as I am. So uh, um, another book that just came out called uh, "Tough <coughs> Tough Rugged Bastards," and it was about a guy who joined the Marine Corps and. Uh, um, wanted to go into a reconnaissance uh, organization and what what it was like for him. And uh, I thought that, that was an interesting book as well. So they're out there and really it's up, up to the, uh, the reader to decide how much they enjoyed the book um, and for what reasons. Um, but yeah, th there are a number out there and I can't, I can't single out. I know uh, Bill Peters, did one on uh, uh, First Force. Um, I think, <clears throat> I want to say it was Never Without Heroes. And I can't remember all the different titles. I mean, I've got a library of these things um, in the next room over. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could go to uh, the Marine Corps Association that sells books and see what they have on, on their list of books and see how many have to deal with the reconnaissance community. And there, there are a number of them out there, not a lot, but a number of them. And uh, just see uh, what they recommend. Yes, sir. They, they're there. So, uh, I mean, you know, Fields of Fire by uh, uh, Webb, I mean, that was a, a classic, although that's a novel. But it's based on his experiences. We did his career interview up in D.C. And, uh, and of course, uh, Bing West has written uh, extensively on, on his tour. Uh, he was with a cap platoon. And uh, some of these stories are, are, are fascinating because they were so much different than what the reconnaissance guys went through. You know, uh, Stories about uh, Hui City, uh, Mark Bowden's book called Hui 1968. That's that's a fantastic read. 
because he went back and he interviewed North Vietnamese soldiers, officers, and Viet Cong uh, who infiltrated Hue City prior to the arrival of the Marines uh, because they believed, the North Vietnamese believed that uh, uh, during the Tet Offensive, there would be this massive uprising by the people of South Vietnam to join uh, the move by the North Vietnamese to uh, consolidate the country. And that didn't happen. So uh, Bowden has written about what it was like uh, from eyewitness accounts of, uh, you know, a reinforced platoon being sent from Fubai up to Hue and being told there was a, a company of uh, Viet Cong uh, sappers uh, running around inside uh, the city of Hue. And what there was were 10,000 NVA waiting for them. And now you get down to uh, what it was like at the platoon and company level, uh, hour by hour, uh, during the battle for uh, Hue City. And the, the research to me was uh, remarkable. And uh, he did that presentation. Uh, I'm a member of the Order of St. Crispins, and we meet quarterly at Mount Vernon Country Club. And he presented his book, and he had uh, uh, Lieutenant General Ron Christmas was there, uh, Myron Harrington, a Navy Cross recipient, company commander was there, uh, Mike Downs, uh, Brigadier General Downs was there, another company commander, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Cheatham, uh, unfortunately, had passed away, but... Uh, for him to give uh, a synopsis of his book in the presence of those Marines who were there, I mean, you can't get much more of a critical review than uh, those people that were there and, and survived it. But uh, if you want a, a, you know, I can't put it down type book, uh, read Quay uh, 1968, a fascinating book. A lot of photographs in it uh, to support what he said. Uh, he even brought with him a uh, Vietnamese doctor who uh, opened up an emergency aid station and treated Marines for two weeks um, during the battle. And he was there. And uh, I mean, just an amazing presentation. And uh, like I said, if you ever get the opportunity, sit down and read Hue 1968. Well, and to continue this conversation on a way, of course, before my next class starts, a book that really complements um, Way 1968 about Bowden is a book called uh, Fire in the Streets by yep. Eric Camel. Um, yep. That one is excellent in itself as well. They both blend and complement together, and they're both different in their approaches, of course, to the story. Well, I think Eric Hamill just passed away last year, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. But I, I did uh, General Downs' career interview and got to know him quite well. And I, in fact, he came to my retirement and uh, and we've met on and off. We meet quarterly. So I look forward to that uh, every couple of months uh, up at Mount Vernon. And uh, I think I told you, you know, his, <clears throat> his other <clears throat> claim to fame was he married one of Chesty Pull's daughters. <laughs> And uh, I always got a kick out of that. When I when I did the uh, interview, I, I shut off the recorder and I said, you know, I, I just want to ask you a question on behalf of every lieutenant and captain uh, in the Marine Corps. Uh, what was going through your mind when you were standing on Chesty Puller's porch in Saluda, Virginia, and ringing the doorbell to take his daughter out? And, you know, he started to laugh and he said, no, 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 no. It wasn't like that at all. He and uh, then uh, Captain Dabney, Bill Dabney, they were both captains together at Yorktown. And he said, uh, Mrs. Puller uh, and this Navy captain's wife were matchmakers. And the Pullers had uh, two girls who were students at Mary Washington College. Back then it was an all-girls college. And uh, they thought, well, we, we know of two uh, eligible single Marine captains there at Yorktown. 
So they went into work, and here's the card saying, uh, Lieutenant General and Mrs. Pollard would enjoy the pleasure of your company at dinner on Saturday night. I'm kind of paraphrasing this, but and they're thinking, oh, my God, you know, what have we done that, you know, General Polo wants to see us? And it was Mrs. Polo who had arranged uh, for them to meet. So uh, I believe uh, General Downs' wife's name is Martha. And uh, he married her after uh, he had survived Quay City. He came back out of Vietnam and, and uh, resumed his uh, relationship with her, and they got married. But uh, <laughs> you know, you're just thinking uh, of all the of all the doorbells you probably did not want to ring. <laughs> that would be Chesty Puller's doorbell at their home in uh, in Saluda. So uh, he thought that was that was kind of funny. But uh, I rem I remember asking him that question. Well, Doc, I think that's a brilliant story to end on for any Marine or anyone who's ever heard of Chesty Pooler. Um, and with that, as always, Doc, thanks for your service and welcome home. All right, partner. Thank you. And uh, get back in touch and, and we'll continue this with your class. Okay. Yes, sir. Absolutely. We will. Thanks, All Doc. Right, Jack. All right, buddy. Bye-bye.